Ladies and gentlemen, before we get to our, uh, our final speaker, I just have a brief announcement. Question cards are being handed out. Uh, I urge any of you that have questions that you wish to ask to one or all of our panelists on today's theme uh, to fill out the card. Just raise your hand. Uh, it'll be picked up for you. And uh, uh, that way we can get right to questions after our next speaker. Okay, so if you have a question, please fill out the card and raise your hand and it'll be picked, picked up. Our final speaker is uh, Mohammed Afzal Mirza. Mr. Mirza is a learned speaker with great knowledge. He has keen interest in youth welfare and has hosted bi-weekly live phone and radio programs explaining contemporary Islamic issues in Toronto. After dedicating his life, he graduated from Ahmadiyya Muslim University situated in Rabwa, Pakistan. After completing his studies in 1976, he then worked as a missionary in various cities throughout Pakistan. From 1981 to 1998, Muhammad worked as an Islamic missionary in California, Illinois, and Michigan in the United States. He is married with three children. He is presently religious minister, Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Delta, with responsibilities covering the province of British Columbia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Muhammad Asfal Mirza to Bradford, West Columbia. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me to uh, begin my conversation with you after I am done with the customary recitation from the Holy Book of Islam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadahu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل نقدة من لساني يفقه I simply seek the refuge in Allah from Satan the accursed one. I begin with his name who is gracious and merciful and I requested him to bless me so I can deliver to you in the easiest way possible so we can have an understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about the role of religion in creating peace and harmony. I will leave my story for the next conference. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write, get into the, the topic. And what I have in mind is that I will presenting you the verses of the Holy Scripture of Islam, the Holy Quran, to build my point. And then here and there I will add from the tradition of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I'll let you draw your own conclusion. Because I can speak my own philosophy, but when I have the Holy Scripture as Quran, and when I have the Prophet as Muhammad, peace be upon him, I don't need to do my own philosophy. I'll be presenting you the philosophy of the Holy Quran in its own words, and I'll be presenting you the lifestyle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which was nothing but the practice of the Holy Quran. I have 10 points. Quickly, I'll present it to you. It'll be a universality of the prophethood. And then it'll be a salvation. Then commonalities, mutual cooperation, dialogue, no compulsion, respect for the sacred personalities of all the faiths and non-faiths, justice and equality, spending in the cause of poor, patient and forbearance, and at the end, the last point will be uh, Prophet Muhammad, mercy for mankind. You know, when Islam started its journey, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, was made very clear that the prophethood which he has been blessed with, it is not new, it is not which is only started with him, rather, it is a continuation of the process which God had laid for us to know him. So in chapter 46, verse number 10, 
He was told, and I quote, Say I am no innovation among messengers, nor do I know what will be done with me or with you. I only follow what is revealed to me, and I am but a plain warner. Again, in chapter 33, uh, 35 and verse number 25, with a slightly different understanding, his mission was explained to him. And I quote, Verily we have sent thee with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and as a warner. And there is no people on earth in any age who did not receive a warner from God. After explaining these two matters to the mission of the Holy Prophet of Islam, and then he was made aware that in order for having a peace and harmony in the society, the best thing would be that since all these prophets who were sent by God, and some of them were given scriptures, and some of them followed scriptures, so it will be a good idea to believe in all the previous prophets and all the pre previous divine scriptures. So, in chapter 3, verse number 85, he reminds the Holy Prophet of Islam, and I quote, he said, Say, we believe in Allah, and that which has been revealed to us, and that which has been revealed to Abraham and Ishmael, and Isaac and Jacob, and the tribes, and in that which was given to Moses and Jesus and other prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and to him we submit. So today a Muslim is unique in this sense that I must believe in all the previous prophets that they were from God and the scriptures which are divine were given to them by God. So the source becomes one and that brings us to the ultimate unity as a human being so that creates real peace and harmony in the society. Now the second thing comes that every religion and their founder, they come and they give a glad tidings to their followers that if you follow these teachings, if you follow my lifestyle, I'll show you the true face of God. You will be granted salvation in this life and in the life to come. So keeping that in mind, Quran says that no one single religion can have monopoly on salvation. So in chapter 5, verse number 70, we are told, and I quote, Surely those who have believed in Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Jews, and the Sabians, and the Christians, whoso believes in Allah, and the last day, and does good deeds, on them shall come no fear, nor shall they grieve. A beautiful teaching, which provides hope to everybody. Whether you believe in Abraham, or you believe in Moses, or you believe in Jesus, or you believe in any other prophet. Quran says, if you believe in one God, and you do your best, and become a righteous person, God says, you should not be having any fear, or you should not be grieving about the life to come. So this salvation which Islam introduces to the world, goes for everybody equally. Then, you know, when we live in the society, there are differences of opinion. There may be different culture. Islam says that in order for us to have a peaceful and harmonious society, we must need to look into the commonalities so we can work it around. Because when we highlight the differences, there are going to be a chaos. Because differences are everywhere. Starting from a family, between the friends and all that. So Quran in chapter 3 verse number 65 taught me, and I quote, Say, O people of the book, come to a word equal between us and you, that we worship none but Allah, and that we associate no partner with him, and that some of us take not others for lords besides Allah, but if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we have submitted to God. See, Quran says, if we can start working, all of us, belonging to different faiths, and if we believe in God, our common goal is to bring people closer to God. If somebody goes to a synagogue, or to a church, or a mosque, at the end of the day, if all these people come out a better person, a positive person, a person who is nothing but peaceful for all of his fellow beings, that's what Islam highlights, that this is our common goal. We need to work around this. Then, as we live in the diverse society, 
Mutual cooperation is another thing which Quran highlights. In chapter 5, verse number 3, and I quote, Help each other in good things of life, and in all such things as are based on the fear of Allah. Do not, however, help one another in the sinful things and transgressions. Anything good you do, I'll join you. The Prophet of Islam from the very young age, he loved to join those associations who will work for peace and those who will work together in order to create peace and harmony in the society. In chapter 2 verse number 149, again it is elaborated from another angle. It says, and I quote, everyone has an ultimate goal to pursue which dominates him. God says, but we fix that goal for you. And that is to be with one another in goodness. Wherever you be, Allah will bring you all together. Surely Allah has the power to do all that he wills. So a goal is given to us as humans that instead of following your personal, only personal goal, you should be working on the points you should be working on the areas which will bring goodness to the society and as such the society will be very healthy from the peace and harmonious side of it now does that mean we should not have dialogue minding our own business quran says you should have dialogue but no dictation no compulsion that's where the problem comes in when two people dis discuss a matter where they differ and they try to communicate with each other and then at the end one thinks that I am the only one either my way or highway Islam says that creates animosity in the society that creates unrest in the society that creates discrimination in the society so Islam teaches me in verse number uh, 126 of chapter 16 and I quote call unto the way of thy Lord with wisdom and goodly exhortation and argue with them in a way that is best surely thy Lord knows best who has strayed from his way and he also knows who are rightly guided at the end of the day if I'm wrong then I am worshiping, worshiping a, a, a God who who has sent me a messenger then God says after you have your dialogue done then leave it there move on with peace and harmony and there will come a time when God will decide between right or wrong but in this world he says we need to live in peace and harmony chapter 2 verse number 257 again reminds me as a Muslim and I quote there should be no compulsion in religion surely right has become distinct from wrong Admonish therefore, for thou art but an admonisher, thou hast not authority to compel them. All this chaos in the world which we saw in the previous centuries, one of the contribution was that everyone thought that I hold the monopoly on the truth and I'll dictate people that my way or a highway. Islam says that will not take us anywhere. Believing in our own faith, and having a dialogue which is peaceful and communication which we are doing just like this evening God says then when there comes a point that we don't agree then we should agree to disagree and walk away from it in a peaceful way then as I mentioned, one of the points I want to, want to highlight was that what if a society which, is, which does not believe in a God or does not have as a religion per se, but they have personalities who they respect and keep dear. Quran has taught us a lesson that we need to still have respect for them. In chapter 6, verse number 109, and I quote, Revile not those whom they call upon besides Allah, lest they, out of spite, revile Allah in their ignorance thus unto every people have we caused their doing seem fair then unto their Lord is their return and he will inform them what they used to do now 
This particular verse of the Holy Quran reminds me of the true incident which took place at the time of the Holy Prophet of Islam, where he practically executed this notion of Islam. At the time, one of the followers of the Holy Prophet of Islam, he, had, he was discussing with a Jew fellow that who is the best prophet. He said Moses is the best, he said no, Muhammad is the best. And another time, one of his companions was again debating with another fellow who was the follower of Prophet Jonah. And the same argument, he said no, Prophet Jonah is the best, he said no, no, Muhammad is the best. So I guess the Muslim fellow probably rubbed him a little harder. And these two fellows at different times they lodged their complaint to the Holy Prophet of Islam and they said, you know, he has disrespected my, my Prophet and he has hurt my feeling. The Prophet of Islam, on both occasions, he called the assembly of his people and simply announced, at one time he says, do not declare my superiority over Moses. The second time he says, do not declare my, me to be superior over Prophet Jonah. At one of these he says, these are all my brothers, we are brothers from one father. Justice and equality is another key factor which really creates peace and harmony in the society. Chapter 49, verse number 14 and I quote, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female and we have made you into tribes and sub-tribes for the sake of easy recognition. Verily, the most honorable among you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous among you. Surely, Allah is all-knowing, all-aware. And then chapter 5, verse number 3, and I quote, And let not the enmity of a people that they hindered from your access to the sacred mosque incite you to treat them with iniquity. Instead, help each other in good things of life and in all such things as are based on the fear of God. Professor Noldek beautifully sums up this Islamic notion in his sayings. He says, and I quote, whoever went to Islam received the same rights and undertook the same duties as the highest and nearest. There are no reserve pews in the mosque Islam has been more successful in maintaining color prejudice than other universal creeds. He says the Muslim Negro Africans are not treated as untouchable by their Arab co-religionists. Ladies and gentlemen, another point which I want to highlight this evening is that a segment of the society which is less fortunate, homeless people, poor people, they need to be taken care of because if they are not being taken care of then the problems happen. Crimes takes place because they do not find that they are being, being, being deal, dealt with with justice. So Quran has made mandatory for a Muslim in chapter 51 verse number 20 and I quote, a part of their wealth comprises that which should be right have belong to the one who asked for help, beggar and the one who could not and the poor. And then in chapter 76 verse number 9 and 10, God says, they feed for love of him, the poor, the orphan, the prisoner, even when they, when they themselves stand in need, saying, we feed you for Allah's pleasure only, we desire no reward nor thanks from you. Beautiful teaching of Islam. It says if there is a person who is poor and the person who is hungry, a person who is homeless, a person who is less fortunate than you are, then it is mandatory that you make sure you take care of his and her needs. Don't leave, leave him alone, that is none of your business. Islam says this is your business, that if you are fortunate enough, if you have more than what the other person has, and he and she is starving, you need to go and help him, because in your wealth, God has put the share of that poor person who you do not see sometimes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming to the end of my topic or my presentation, patience and forbearance. You know when we do good work, sometimes not recognized. Sometimes people think, oh he has some other agendas. God says, when you are working to establish peace and harmony in the society, no matter what comes in your way, it should not discourage you. 
Rather, you should go forward with the understanding of peace and harmony to be established and offer that you are the patience and forbearer person. And then we see that the Prophet of Islam, after he was appointed as a Prophet, he was in, it was 13 years he spent in his hometown Mecca. And then when he was forced to leave his hometown and migrate to another close by city called Medina, before he leaves, many of his followers were murdered. Everybody was brutally treated. They have no rights whatsoever. Many atrocities were committed against them, whether it be male or female. Alike, they were killed. And then, all these assassination attempts which were made against him does not discourage him to live a peaceful life and extend peace to the society. So 13 years of Mecca and about 10 years in Medina which he lived, most of these, this time he lived under severe persecution from people. But he knew. Because in chapter 21 of the Holy Quran, verse number 108, he was told that what kind of person he needs to be and what is embedded in him. Quran says, and I quote, addressing the Holy Prophet of Islam, and we have not sent thee, but a mercy for all people. So what happens? Many, as I said, many assassination attempts in Mecca. So he leaves Mecca, goes to Medina. His followers, who have been deprived from all their basic and human rights, they also migrate to Medina. He thinks... He should be in peace while well, he's Medina. Four major assassination attempts were made against him. I'm just going to pick up one incident. A lady, she sent him some food, prepared food, so he can eat as a gift. So he has his companion there sitting. The minute he took a bite, he realized there is something wrong with his food. Because he felt burning on his tongue. So he told his companion, don't eat it. Wait, but the companion probably had taken a couple of bites. After a while, he expired, he dies. So he finds out that who has sent this meal for me? They were told there is a lady in the, in the city, in Medina. He says, why don't you go and bring her so I can talk to her? The lady comes up. He asks her a question. Did you put any poison in this food? She said, yes. He said, why? Why did I do to you? She said, because you being here as a prophet is causing problem for us. So I thought, if you are not a true prophet, if you have not been commanded by God, giving you poison will kill you and we will get rid of you and we'll live in peace again. But if you are from God, then God will save you. So God has saved you. He liked his answer and honesty. He said, may God forgive you. And he let her go. Now, while he was in Medina, and as I mentioned, that he was brutally treated in Mecca. So when he comes in Medina after a while, the Meccan people face a very severe drought. And one of his bitter enemy, Abu Sufyan, is sent by Meccans to go and meet the Prophet and request him to pray for us and help us. So this man comes and meets the Prophet of Islam and requests him that, listen, you are a, a merciful man and you are a noble person, please pray because we are really facing the drought and uh, we are almost, you know, have exhausted everything we had. The Prophet of Islam told him, how daring you are coming to seek help for those people who have done so much to us, but I will pray for them because they are human beings. And then he also sent some material help for the Meccans. Now I'm coming when Mecca is fallen down now and Muhammad enters Mecca as a victorious. So you see, when you don't have power, you can speak of peace, you can speak of tolerance, you can speak of forgiveness, you can speak of forbearance, you can speak of all the high quality you got because you don't have a power to prove it. But when you got power, that is the time when you are really tested that how, what kind of person you are. So he comes back in Medina with 10,000 people now into Mecca and all these people who had committed all kinds of atrocities against him and his people. 
he collects them and asks them a question. He said, you know what you have done to us throughout the years. So what do you expect now that how should I treat you? A noble man stands up and he says, Muhammad, we know you are a, a, a kind person. We have known you a sympathetic person. We have known you as a merciful. So we expect that you forgive us. The Holy Prophet ﷺ was kind of like waiting for that response. He immediately spoke to them. He said, Is He said, Go, all of you are free today. There are no blame on anybody. A general amnesty was issued for them. All were forgiven. You know, when scholars who are not Muslims, when they study the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam, when they study these kind of teachings of the Holy Quran, you know what they say? Let me read out to you just one just two small quotations. One from Karen Armstrong. She wrote a book about the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam. She says, Muhammad took Mecca without shedding a drop of blood. None of the Quraysh was forced to become Muslim. She says, single-handedly, Muhammad had brought peace. Single-handedly, Muhammad had brought peace to war-torn Arabia. And then, Edward Gibbon. Again, he wrote a very, you know, beautifully about many things and he wrote a book which is called The History of Decline and Fall of Roman Empire. He says, Muhammad is free from suspicions or ambiguity and the Quran is glorious testimony to the unity of God. The sayings of Muhammad were so many lessons of truth, his actions so many examples of virtue. He asserted the liberty of conscience and disclaimed the use of religion violence. Ladies and gentlemen, when you have a religion like Islam, you will end up nothing but having real peace and harmony in the society. May God help us to understand and exercise all of these beautiful teachings which you just heard before me, that we can have a peaceful place to live, so we can have a society where we can engage in peaceful activities and peaceful dialogue. Thank you very much for listening.